we only learn to embrace our own suffering by understanding the suffering of the world. The inspiring zone of my radical change, one day when I've called it quits, being a news presenter is when I opted to become a documentary filmmaker. Good morning. This is Mama Marlene from the president of the board of directors for the Global Presence. And I am very excited this morning to be presenting along with my co-host, the vice president of the Global Presence, Dr. Daniel Ibarondo, the 2021 Global Presence Humanitarian Award to Pakistani humanitarian documentary filmmaker, Nazia Mahmood. I'll turn the microphone over to you, Nizia, and have you share what inspired you to begin your path as a humanitarian documentary filmmaker. Thank you very much, Mama Marlene. I am at a loss of words, um, and I'm not still 100% sure if this is really happening, but my palpitation warns me that it is. And uh, all I can tell you is that I feel I have possibly accomplished all that I could, to name a few, uh, from uh, a successful news presenter to an acknowledged documentary filmmaker, an advertised poet, and uh, an award-winning storyteller, and now a humanitarian award recipient. Um, this is overwhelming, and I am not sure how to thank the global presence. You started alone, and now you have a huge caravan with you of so many great human beings that one is so proud of. It's a never ending learning. And the best thing that you've done and people like you who are doing it is before all the humanitarian tasks and people behind it were like unsung heroes. And now beyond expectation, we are being honored. Uh, so I really don't have the words. I feel really accomplished. Rest assured, I'm still the same old person who's scared to death as to what my life is going to be from this point onwards. Um, but the, like you asked me, the motivation of my success, I think it was persistence as a child and even as a youngster. I had so much to say always. But then again, at the same time, I felt deprived of being at liberty of speaking my heart to a single creature. So I found my, um, what do you say, conduit in work. And I was excessively passionate about it and mostly excelled in whatever I put my mind to. But this did not win me many friends, if I'm honest. However, several animosities were developed until one day. I said to myself, enough. And that was a turning point in my life. It's uh, quite a beguiling incident that when you have it all and you are at the peak of your career or what you could possibly do, the best and one fine day, you just call it quits. That's what I did. Just because of the fact that despite my plate being full, my heart felt empty, like something is missing. You know, I, I could not ignore those emotions. Somehow I was feeling or sensing that I was living a pretentious life and there was something further that I was chosen to do. But at that time, still, I did not know. And that's more than a decade ago. And this happened, this was to in 2000, 2009. The need for stillness outweighed my ego. Sometimes when we are heartbroken, and the last thing we want to do is what makes us comfortable. <laughs> so that's where the light is waiting to arrive, actually. So I decided to trail common human beings because, as they say, no, no mud, no lotus. And despite the conditions, the lotus flower maintains strength. You know, it pushes aside all the obstacles the dirty obstacles and makes it wear to the clearer surfaces. So the core misery of our present day existence, in my opinion, is that we don't really know how to handle the inner suffering. And then we try to cover up with all kinds of works. And that's what I was doing. So the fact is without suffering, there is no happiness. And there is no point discriminating against the wind. We only learn to embrace our own suffering by understanding the suffering of the world. 
but with a lot of sensitivity. You need that sensitivity. And so the inspiring zone of my radical change, one day when I've called it quits, being a news presenter is uh, when I opted to become a documentary filmmaker. And the subject that I chose was the life on streets of Karachi. I really had no idea as to why I'm choosing that subject, but I think the, the beggars on the pathways that we see everywhere, mostly in this part of the world, kind of unsettled me. And I felt that somehow I was discriminating against the mud or the wind. Consequently, I jumped into altogether another world and the way these street children or street flowers uh, communicated with me and responded to my queries and questions and fetched their wisdom earned through suffering was beyond imagination and, and it's hard to describe really. So I was kind of addicted to this side of reality and the documentary was called Footpath. It was in 2009, September. It was fairly effective in terms of uh, some files were moved, like I said earlier on the provincial level regarding the child protection bill. And also people began noticing these flowers on the street, the lost flowers on the street. Many TV channels uh, chose to labor on the same on matching subject thereafter, but I had the privilege of being the trailblazer, hence big responsibility. Um, but after foot, Footpath, I never looked back. I continued to fetch more stories, the voices of the voiceless, humanity of humanitarians like Evie, as we keep talking about. I have uh, I've had the privilege of working on him, with him, and I can never be grateful enough for the illuminations on the path of my journey during that time that facilitated me to shine so vividly. Then I started feeling that this is not the line of my living, but this is kind of my purpose. I have to do this all my life. And it doesn't matter if it doesn't bring food on my table because it brings uh, food to many people's souls who have been invisible. And many times I later I sat with these children on the road uh, who were selling toys. It was a gratifying time, really, I felt so grounded. I learned from them more than what I learned from the books or the bookkeepers, so to say. It took me a decade to realize that this, this is a calling forever. It's not a momentary or temporary calling. The things are still the same. And uh, only last year, my heart called out to, to work the entire documentary footpath. And the new name was Street Bullets. We sent it to festivals and it backed four international awards, including Seattle International Film Festival and the Indie Filmmaker Film Festival. That was very, very motivating for me. I mean, I, I least expected this, that there are other parts of the world where people see problems of this part of the world. It's, it's sad that sometimes our own people are unable to, and they need more awakening. And sometimes it's beyond a step ahead of awakening. And we need to see beyond our own problems. Sometimes we only realize what we need, but if we just have an eye, you know, a soul eye to see beyond that, we realize that the more we give, the more we get. It's as simple as that. But it's not just giving to people who are dear to us, who are around us. The need is to give and realize the need of people who are in need. I began writing poetry meanwhile, and it contained messages of compassion and the truths of life that was going parallel with my documentaries. But it's imperative to mention that I always, always had hope until two years ago, I lost it. And how should I say this? It's, it's a stranger helped me find it, without whom I would not be speaking here at all. Hence, I feel a huge responsibility in terms of paying forward the hope. It's the best gift one human being can give to another. And now that's what I do mostly, lending hope to another human being, either through my voice or my time, my compassion, learnings, and most of it a listening ear. And uh, that's an incredibly rewarding and humbling experience in so many ways. And most importantly, the feeling that my resonating existence found its purpose. It makes a difference. And it doesn't matter to me if the world sees it, because if the world sees the difference it doesn't matter if it doesn't see who's made the difference, really. I recently created a documentary, in fact, uh, two days ago for like donations for a center of peace, which is called Darul Sukoon in Karachi. In the, the branch of Karachi has almost 500 challenged children and adults. Uh, most of them are physically and mentally challenged. 
some of them are just physically challenged and they are disowned by families. They are disowned by society. And because I had made a documentary on street children and children, special children, I wasn't really appreciated in my TV channel. They thought I'm doing work which is probably considered nuisance in this part of the world. And so I was sacked. And right after I was sacked, I received um, a humanitarian reporting award by an NGO. So that motivated me and I did not sort of worry about what happened. And I decided that I'm going to continue doing that. In the meantime, a lot of work was done in the same context. And then after a decade, I think that things that we start needs to continue. And they only finish when we are finished. First step is awakening. The, the realization of the second step, like, like I said, is actually action. I feel enriched. And if I'm honest, the old me was crippled by the fear that I wasn't interesting enough before or smart enough or important enough to make my voice heard. But yet, here I am speaking, <laughs> infinitely grateful that the old me no longer dictates who I am today. And if I had to choose the most important catalyst to vanquishing the blocks that crippled me for decades of my life, I'd have to say that it was a process of, process of overcoming my fears, my limiting beliefs. And automatically I started gravi gravitating towards people, places and situations that inspired me. And uh, being recognized by the global presence today is such a huge honor for me. I mean, it makes me feel extraordinary. Um, and it's absolutely encouraging to outshine in spreading the gift of hope. I'm so, so grateful. Thank you. We are equally intensely honored to recognize your work, Nazia. We, we strive when we select our humanitarian award recipients to select someone who really can be inspiring to everyday people. The Global Presence Humanitarian Award is unique in that we choose recipients almost based on their everydayness. They all just felt they were going about their daily lives and then they had this inner calling and they had the courage as you have just shared, even though it cost you your, your position as a successful TV news anchor, but you listened, you listened to your calling. And it is truly miraculous, the works that are born from that level of courage, putting yourself out there for others, concern for others. Will you share, some people are not, um, many people perhaps, are not familiar with the work of Abdul Sattar Edi. And I literally sobbed watching your documentary, The Lamp. Will you share a bit more about him and the, the content of your documentary, The Lamp? Thank you so much for asking. This is one of my favorite questions. Edi is one of the most renowned humanitarians. He started his uh, mission almost seven decades ago. Uh, he passed five years ago. He transitioned. Um, but what he did for seven decades was something had he not done, this part of the world, our city, our country would be partially like a graveyard. Times were difficult. We needed a humanitarian like that. So a lot of people worked on him, the figures of his ambulances. He started off with one ambulance with 5,000 rupees. And his calling was that he saw his mother suffer. And uh, he looked after her for many, many years. And she taught him about giving. She used to give him two Annas, two pesas at that time, and one for himself and one to, to help another human being uh, in need. And that's what he, he continued to do until her, his mother transitioned. And that became the mission of his life. And when I met him, and when I sat with him, I have no words to explain that the energy that I felt, we had not spoken. We were just sitting together. And he didn't know me by then. So I spent sitting in silence about two or three hours. And that gave me a feeling and energy which was out of this world. And I decided that I got to work with this angel, <laughs> angel energy. But because people had already described what he's done and how many ambulances does he have and what, where did he go and what did he do for people, all the figures were well known. But I wanted to concentrate on the energy that he created and uh, what was his idea of humanity. 
And it took me a year to really understand that, that being human is being content with what you have, not worrying about gaining more and more and more just material things. Have an eye, a third eye, a soul eye. Be compassionate towards suffering in general. Without discriminating, pay forward. Be a good human. Just do your contribution, even if it's for one person. And I don't think I can really measure his, his works, to be honest, or really tell you what he's done. But what he has done, in short, is that he has never discriminated anyone, be it a Christian or a Muslim or a Hindu. He was the same with everyone. He started begging on the streets because he had this purpose. It was so strong that people started coming to him. And then he, wore, he had millions and billions of rupees, but he stayed in two pieces of clothes. And uh, he used to eat very, very simple food, despite being such a rich, richest poor man of this world. <laughs> and that's how it started. And it continued for seven decades. I mean, he was a selfless human being, an angel in the form of a human being. I think whoever wanted to learn would have just observed him. He really walked his talk. And I think there, that's where my, my, calling, my calling was revised, improvised. And it took me time to understand, but it's, it's beyond the length of uh, anybody's imagination to measure up to his standard. But even if we do 1% of what he has been doing selflessly, without expecting anyone, without worrying about any materialistic gains, his, his motto was humanity above all. And humanity is not just that you give your charity. And then you say, oh my God, I've given my share. Now God should give me more. And that's all about it. But you don't follow up. What happens with your charity? You need to follow up. You need to know. You need to understand that your charity, in terms of your compassion, your money, your time, is making a difference. Because then it's never going to become part of your soul, part of your you know, inner, inner self. And unless that is continuously sort of, <laughs> what do you call it, um, shaken. This is, is not possible because we tend to, as human beings, forget what callings we have. We tend to get involved and, you know, to engrossed in our own works all the time. It's great. It's good to do. It's good to be alert of what's happening around us, what's happening in your life. But it's also good to be aware of our surroundings. No, everybody doesn't need money, to be honest. People need time, people need compassion, people need a listening ear. It, this, this makes the world a better place. And whenever you can, you need to understand that excuses uh, give way to fear. And fear is the worst possible thing. Fear that of, of curiosity, of what's in it for me. Only if you realize that kindness paid forward, no matter in what form, it comes to you in the, in the most unexpected ways. It never goes without making a different, better difference in this world. And we can do it for even a person who's, who's less privileged in our surroundings. We don't have to go out in the world and become easy. You don't have to compare and try and become like somebody. But the learnings that we acquire from that person um, in whatever percentage makes a difference. And I think it really made me a better person, a better version of myself. I earn less than before, but <laughs> I feel more accomplished and more, more enriched. So I'm so, so grateful. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. We are equally grateful. We're recognizing your work, but our hearts are overflowing with joy and gratitude uh, for the opportunity and the privilege to shine a light on your works and your voice. And it's a great honor to recognize your trailblazing in the arena of altruism and the populations you have given voice to. We're so excited to follow your future and support you in your future to service works. Thank you. So you are in exceedingly good company and, and much deserved company. You really found your tribe, Nizia, of courageous humanitarians around the world, and you inspire all of us to Thank be you. courageous, listen to our inner voices, listen to the inner calling, step out of our own small realities and be human. I, I'd, I'd like to bring up uh, Nazia's uh, website just for those who uh, want to become familiar with her work, okay? Uh, so this is her website here and uh, 
more information on her documentaries of poetry. And, and I mean, she is so talented. Look at these sketches as well. I mean, it's just, just incredible. But the poetry and the uh, documentaries. Uh, so uh, naziamamoud.com, um, bookmark it and, and come to the website for more information on our humanitarian of the year. Thank you so much. I think I'm really short of words. <laughs> really honored and this is this gives me motivation to do more inshallah